Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another rowing chat. I'm Rebecca Caro, and this month, Rowing Chat is sponsored by Faster Masters Rowing. It's a new subscription coaching service for Masters athletes. Does your group train without a regular coach? Do you get frustrated that you're coming second in races or not making race finals? Are you struggling with adapting rowing technique and rowing training as you age? Let the experts help. Marlene Royal has been coaching older athletes for decades. She understands the needs of masters and so has created an online monthly downloadable training program. It comes in six modules, a training program, a technique program, land training exercises, peak performance tips, rowing lifestyle advice, and a bonus gift. And you get one of each of those every single month. It's available for individuals, for crews, or a complete club. The Faster Masters Rowing Program is the solution that will make you row faster this year. Click on the programs link at www.fastermastersrowing.com and take a look. Now, today, my guest is Megan O'Leary. Megan, welcome to Rowing Chat. Yeah, Rebecca, thank you for having me. Glad to be here. Now, tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and your background in rowing. Sure. So I am a member of the United States National Rowing Team, a 2016 Olympian, six-time national team member. Um, I joined the sport of rowing as a very, very uh, green rookie. Um, I grew up in sports. I was an athlete uh, all through you know, childhood, high school, uh, and I went to university actually as a two-sport athlete in volleyball and softball at the University of Virginia, which is actually a you know, fantastic rowing school, um, ironically. And, you know, while there, uh, the head coach, current head coach as well, Kevin Sauer, had approached me and said, you know, you should row. And I, <laughs> I thanked him, obviously flattered that, you know, a head coach of a, you know, NCAA championship program would, would think that I had kind of what it takes. Um, but I said, I'm busy. I have no idea about this sport. Um, and so just, you know, kind of went on my way. But I think it planted the seed. And it really wasn't until several years later uh, when I, I was working as a professional, I was actually working at ESPN in Connecticut, and which for me, uh, I grew up in the South, mostly the Midwest and the South. And I was, you know, it was kind of like, well, I'm in New England. This is where you row. I should try rowing. And so I literally Googled rowing and lessons or something and found a local boathouse, uh, Riverfront Recapture on the Connecticut River um, in Hartford, Connecticut, where I, where I lived. And you know, signed up for the learn to row lessons. Um, it was the summer of you know 2010. I think it was late June, early July 2010, when I showed up for my first rowing lesson. And I, I nearly drove away because I was sort of so terrified at what I'd gotten myself into. <laughs> but, you know, and I'm so glad I hadn't. Right? It, that was the you know that was that first step into this just life changing career. Um, and right, that was that was nine years ago. Um, yeah, to the month because it was June. So here we are, June of 2019. And from there, you know, obviously things dramatically changed, and I fell in love with the sport very quickly. Um, and kind of told myself, "Wow, like I'm young enough. Let's see what I could do. I want to compete at a very high level." Um, a year later, I was invited to join. A year later, right? So <laughs> a year later, I was in invited to join the National Team Training Center and moved to Princeton, New Jersey. Um, the weekend of the head of the Charles, I'd, I raced and then packed up my U-Haul and went down to Princeton, New Jersey and started my career. Um, made my first team in 2013 and I guess I haven't looked back since. Well, congratulations. And of course, you're also a rowing blogger, which is how I first got, feel I got to know you um, because I've been reading your website and your blog. But you wrote a rather incendiary blog post a month ago called Why Elite Rowing Will Never Be Popular in the USA. And that's the theme that I'd really like to kick off with today on our rowing chat. So what made you write that? Sure. And it's it's interesting the reactions that I've gotten from that post. I, you know, um, I like to 
I like to think that I, I, it was intentionally provocative. I wanted to stir a conversation in the rowing community around um, you know, the need for better coverage. And I do think as a sport, we've, we've, we've started to make advances. I mean, the drone footage at the Henley is, you know, a couple of years ago when that was first implemented was just sort of game changing. It, it really brought the viewer inside the race. You feel like you're on top of the boat, you know, in the, in the following judges boat, you're, you feel like you're there. Um, and I remember the conversation around that. And it was, it was just this incredible, wow, like this is, this is a new level. Um, and we've seen improvements on the world, you know, world rowing productions as well. Um, but I think, you know, I still think they're small. These are small advancements in, you know, where the media landscape is today. Uh, we, you know, we as a sport, in order to, to catch up and to stay relevant, um, we, you know, we really need to be thinking about the, the, the ways in which we can do that. Because, you know, I mean, we're seeing it. The, the truth of the matter is that survival at the Olympic level, especially for, you know, for just talking about elite level sports, rowing um, as an Olympic sport, it's, it's, it's different than it was 20, 30 years ago. Um, no longer is the tradition of sport, that doesn't mean that you're going to be at the Olympics. You now have to have a fan following. You now have to garner ratings. You now have to be interesting to sponsors. Um, and, you know, people have to be watching you live in order for you to stay on the program. That's the truth of it. It, you know, we don't like to talk about that. We don't like to think about that because our sport is so pure. Um, but I think for, you know, for an effort to keep our sport alive and, you know, and bring it to even more people, uh, we really need to think about the ways in which we're covering it. And when I sat there, you know, it was Sunday of the finals of, you know, it's the U.S. Rowing Trials 1. And we had, I mean, I was so disappointed <laughs> in the lack of coverage, even, you know, even just, you know, a live stream, a Facebook live, an Instagram live. Um, it was, I struggled to understand why we didn't have the basics of what I felt like, you know, it's 2019, it's the Olympic qualification year. Uh, next year's 2020, it's the Olympics. The storytelling starts now. It started last year. And we, you know, that was a huge misstep, I felt. Um, and so I just, you know, it's something that I've been thinking about for a long time and just, I sat down for an hour and wrote that and then, you know, kind of sat on it, slept on it for a few days and then decided, hey, like, let's have a conversation. Let's see what kind of reaction we can get in an effort to let's make positive change from this. So that was my inspiration and kind of, you know, the whole reason behind wanting to put, you know, put some words out there that people they're not going to like or they may like, they may agree with. But if you disagree, great, let's have a conversation. Let's 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 figure out why and come up with solutions. So what is the you were at the selection regatta for U.S. team athletes to get on the team for this year's World Championships. What actual media coverage was there? So let's just talk about the facts. Sure. You know, and I did some research and I included that I intentionally, you know, I was like, I want this to be very, you know, I want to I want to demonstrate what we what we had um, and what we didn't have. Uh, there was no live stream uh, in terms of just, you know, throw it up on YouTube, throw it up on Facebook. Uh, so there was no video. Um, we did have live results, which is just here now in the U.S. We use here now, um, and it was just final times. It wasn't like you know, with World Rowing, you can have a tracker and you can actually watch the race play out. It was just you had to wait sometimes minutes <laughs> for the actual results, you know, results to pop up. Um, I couldn't find any live tweeting. Uh, there certainly wasn't any announcing of live tweeting. Uh, you know, I included in my post, kind of in the states, the you know, the primary kind of covers of, you know, rowing here, at least at the elite level. So, you know, it's US rowing, rowing related, row 2K, um, you know, every once in a while rowing news gets gets kind of into the game. But, you know, there wasn't, to my knowledge either, there just apparently wasn't any on-site presence. Um, I did get, you know, I got an email from row 2K saying this was, you know, the first time in I think 20 something years that they they didn't really have anyone on site because of, again, it's, it's a collegiate rowing season at the time. And, there were there were huge regattas kind of across the country, and they're you know they're a small operation. Um, but so Row 2K had they there wasn't anything live coming from them either. They posted photos days after, um, and then you know U.S. Rowing there was no again no kind of live announcing, live tweeting. Just hey, they were you know kind of a daily press release of the results, but nothing live. In today's world, everything is on demand. It's right now. <laughs> you want to know and you want to be a part of the action, not 24 hours later. So do you know if U.S. Rowing even has a media list? Because I'm on the media list for British Rowing 
and for New Zealand rowing. And I there's also a collegiate group of people, I mean collegiate as in a friendly group of people, who are rowing journalists who maintain a mailing list amongst themselves. Do you know if they even have that sort of thing? You know, I think there is an email distribution list. To what to what level? I don't know how it's used, right? In terms of um, you know I, the press releases, I'm sure distributed to it. I don't know who's on it um, or how active it is. Um, so I couldn't answer that question super clearly <laughs> for you. Now, let's back off a little bit from just talking about the actual live racing to talk about the media contract that you as an athlete, you sign a contract with US Rowing when you get selected. Can you recall what is in your obligations and what is in perhaps some restrictions around you and the media when you're on the team? Sure. So it's interesting. I should review this for you. And it is, we sign it. It's not um, most of most of what's asked of us pertains, I would say, to our international competition and aligns with like the FISA rules, right? Of, you know, kind of general guidelines of best practices, um, making sure we're representing ourselves and our team in a positive light. Um, and then, you know, I think with the FISA rules, and I'm not sure this is necessarily in our media, um, ours is not extensive. This is like me obviously not being able to recall, but it's not extensive because we don't have direct media partners, right? But I know that with you know with FISA and International, we have to be careful of you know sharing any live footage of racing, that sort of thing. Um, in general, it's just kind of casting ourselves and representing our team, you know, in the United States in a, in a positive light. Um, if we are approached for questions or comment, um, and we're speaking for ourselves, just you know, best practices take into account. If we're representing U.S. Rowing, obviously it, it, we should hand it over to our, our press officer. Um, but it's not extensive. And it covers you during the racing in the international season. And of course, this was a domestic selection mm -hmm. regatta. Yeah, so we don't have to we don't have to sign anything for that at all. It's totally so, just international. Now the British Rowing also had their selection regatta a few weeks ago, around about the same time, and there were howls of protest from well-known rowing journalists on Twitter that the they had been banned they'd been invited to a private selection regatta held at their training venue Cavisham, and they were told that they were banned from putting up any photographs or live streaming of any of the crews who were racing this was a first and naturally as journalists they were sitting there going well what the mm, are we supposed to be reporting on if it's just just times and ratings did you read yeah, that? I saw this. I saw the. I saw some of the stuff happening on Twitter because I follow, you know, Rowing Voice. Or, or um, right, yeah. it's there's some of the, you know, in terms of sh there was a video posted. She had to take it down, um, and I it, it struck me as curious. I, I assumed that this was a rule that was put in place. I'm actually I'm surprised to hear that it was just this year. Um, it does it. <laughs> I always and maybe it's because I'm an, I still consider myself an outsider to the sport. I always laugh when there's so much. Um, privacy around like, you know, my training plan and this is my crew and, you know, we don't want any pictures and we don't, I mean, it's the rowing stroke. We all do pretty much the similar version of it. We all actually work pretty much the same like levels, maybe different workouts placed different ways. But at the end of the day, um, it's not like we're protecting our plays for, you know, in a football or a basketball where that is a little bit more of kind of that intellectual property of like, this is, you know, this is, we created this play. Um, I've always found it interesting, the level of pri privacy and sort of keep, keep it all, keep everyone out um, from our sport, because I do think it, it I mean, it, it hurts our sport because people are interested. They want to know, like, what kind of work are we doing? And they love to watch. I mean, I think, you know, Row 2K survives on the ads that they, you know, that they are able to sell because so many people look at the photos of racing photos, training photos, you know, that's, that's what interests people to be, you know, you're a part of the experience and to have to have that blocked out, it's. I think it's hurting the sport. I think it's hurting the, you know, kind of the fan um, growth and awareness of the sport, the interest in the sport that inspires young people to want to, you know, to want to be a part of the sport. Um, if they can see their heroes on the water, whether by video or just in photos even. Yeah, I totally agree. And yeah, I started this podcast in 2013. So five years ago. And I've been writing a rowing blog since around 2007. And that was my way of 
taking my background, which is in marketing rather than media, but bringing that to the sport. And I vividly remember you can apply for a media pass for Henley Royal Regatta. And I wrote an application saying that I was a rowing blogger and could I come in the get access to the media area. And I knew that that was going to cause a problem because they'd never had a blogger apply before. And what was a blogger? You can imagine I didn't get the conversations. But this individualization of the sport of rowing into online digital media has been hugely beneficial to me. I have built and sold a business, Row Perfect, off of the back of being the blog that people came to to get their rowing questions answered. And now I'm trying to do the same with a network of podcasts and people like you who are generous enough, thank you, for you know <laughs> talking about the issues that matter. Tell me that I think the media landscape has massively shifted and the command and control structures that work for the Olympics, they work for some national teams, particularly as you described, during the scope of the international regatta. And yet outside of those restrictions, the athlete is now increasingly able to build a fan base and start having a discussion, a one, not just a one-to-many discussion, but actually a dialogue, a backwards and forwards. And so can you tell us about your experience with your blog work? Because that was the first thing you did, is that right? Right. So for rowing, like in terms of my rowing blog, yeah. And, you know, I initially... I like to write, you know, that's why I got into to sports journalism, to sports media. Um, originally thought I wanted to, to be a writer, um, got into, you know, television. I love the, the concept of visual storytelling. And so when I, when I sort of embarked upon this rowing journey, <clears throat> I had a lot of people, you know, ask me and tell me, they're like, I, I really want to follow you because they didn't, you know, most of my, my people were not rowers, right? They, they didn't understand the sport, but they wanted, to, they wanted to live the journey through me. And so that's what started my blog. I have not been as avid um, uh, updates lately. Uh, I was pretty good in the 2016 cycle, um, and I'm hoping to get you know back to a little bit more regular updates. But you know, it was my way of of bringing people in to you know here's this here's this 25, 26 year old, you know that Google the sport. Um, I'm you know I'm kind of fumbling around uh, like a you know a small child learning how to walk for a while, but then you know I eventually you know, kind of with showing up every day and, and kind of putting my mission to work, I've been able to make the national team. Now I'm, I'm just a couple years out from the Olympics. And so when people feel like they can follow you and follow the athlete, and this is why the power of Instagram, the power of Facebook has become so powerful with, with sport coverage is people feel like they know you, right? Like I was reaching people that I've never met. Um, because they they could you know they could empathize with my journey to their you know I just started in I don't know how many emails I got I just started a new job I left you know I, I took the big risk because you inspired me and, and now you know I'm doing XYZ and I mean that's that's the joy of sport right and so when we share those things and, and help people become a part of you know what we're doing as athletes um, it, it spreads not only the sport but it it brings people even more people in um, and so that's, you know, that's kind of what drove me to, for my blog. Um, it was more of a personal kind of <laughs> this, what rowing has done to my life. Right. Um, and, you know, this piece that I posted back in April was really the first, I think, commentary um, on the sport itself. And, and I think now that I can no longer call myself an outsider after having been in the sport now for nine years, um, I really see, I see the value in the sport. I believe in the sport and, you know, I, I don't, I don't want it to go away. And I think we can reach more people, we can be better, we can be bigger, but we absolutely have to change, you know, and we have to be innovative and we have to, you know, kind of welcome um, that, you know, while we're an old traditional sport, we, we, can, we can be hip and cool too, right? So what would your ideal media future look like? Paint a picture for us. Oh, man. So, you know, it's no secret that the sport of rowing may look very different 10 years from now, right, in terms of its Olympic coverage. Um, I think we'll always have the traditionalists of 2000, you know, the 2000 meters, but we've seen, you know, some of like Red Bull has, has covered some interesting rowing events, you know, here in the States, we had the Red Bull stakes and it was this stake turn on the, you know, the Charles river in Boston. And I mean, you had boats kind of crashing and cra you know, crabs and flips and um, it was, you know, extreme rowing. And then you have the race and the, the name is losing me where 
you know, the guys race in the eight and they have to pick it up and run it through the city. Yeah. And the the city yeah. Yes. And then they did the seven bore in, in the UK, which is a natural small wave that happens in on the river seven. That's right. They've done a lot. I loved watching that. Right. And so <laughs> I'm not saying that that is rowing, but neither is, you know, when you, when you think of, um, you know, the rise of all the X game sports that have now basically determined our winter games, Olympic program, you know, the, the ways in which those sport become, you know, sort of the, I don't want to call them antics, but like the disciplines that you see the media covered are versions of the sport that is then the traditional version, right? That is the Olympic sport. And I think we can do that with rowing, you know, making it shorter, more basically viewable um, for, you know, fans, whether it's on TV or it's in presence attendance, I would love to see us have, you know, we have the World Cup in terms of elite rowing. Let's let's just talk in this window for a second. We have the World Cup circuit, right? Three World Cups. Within that, there's Europeans, which is just the Europeans. <laughs> and then there's, you know, and then there's the World Championships. And th that's really it. So you have four, maybe five, let's call, you know, Euros. Like, that's not a lot at all of opportunities for, you know, athletes to demonstrate their prowess. I know rowing, it's not like we can race every weekend. Um, but I do think that there are opportunities for us to, you know, get rowing, let's call it on TV, uh, in more digestible ways. So I would love to see us come up with a, a shorter racing circuit. I have this like vision in my mind of, you know, I think they do it in the Netherlands, like in the canals, they do these series of celebrity races where they bring out sort of, it's just like a short, I think it's like a hundred meters, right? They get their national team rowers to race against, you know, sort of other Dutch athletes or Dutch celebrities, people show up, they crowd the canals. It's, I mean, to me, I'm like, that sounds amazing. <laughs> so I think we could do that in the States. Um, we don't have a ton of rowing venues, but we have a lot of rivers and a lot of urban, you know, urban settings where this could, this could really take off. And I think, you know, bringing the sport to where people already are will be important instead of, you know, demanding that people come out to the middle of nowhere where the only, you know, six lane 2K course exists. Um, so I don't know the future, the future of the media landscape would be that we have, you know, I think we need to come up with sort of a series of events separate from, you know, the current kind of program of the world cup circuit, the Olympic program, um, that, you know, it makes it more exciting. It's shorter, it's shorter form, um, that we can sell. I think sponsors would get behind that. Right. Um, and that, you know, we can, maybe it's in the fall after the world championships or something, we can fit it into the program, but you can then, you know, you can create on demand kind of an on demand service around that. There's so much streaming out there now, you know, I mean, ESPN plus just launched, I think last year, Hulu now has live sports flow sports. Like there's so many opportunities for content to exist at, at a pretty cheap price that I think rowing, we're doing ourselves a disservice by not getting in the game. I totally support that. And particularly <laughs> the restrictive media contracts that have been made country by country. Uh, it so happens that New Zealand until this year was the only country where Sky Sport blocked the world rowing streamed service. And that just makes me go silent scream. It's really frustrating. I would happily pay just to get that program and of course that is not available as part of a you have to sign up to a package and you know a year's contract and so on i love your ideas of shorter format racing there is has been an attempt to do it in the uk based on the german bundesliga bundesliga bundes are the the states in germany and every sport has a league where you you compete to get to the top of your state and then they have the interstate championships and they have it for hot field hockey they have it for soccer they have it for lots of big sports and they start doing it with rowing and it's between 350 and 500 meters it's always in a city center venue sometimes it's like in a lake in a shopping village um or right in a city center so very very short fast and furious winning margins are tiny and as you correctly identified go to where the people are rather than expecting the people to come to you is a good principle to get these things going and i think that i know that they tried this in britain and i have a sneaking suspicion that it's slightly faltering um again not quite sure of the detail but maybe that will be another podcast perhaps listeners could put me in touch with whoever's running that 
But let's talk a little bit more about uh, you. Do you have an understanding of licensing in the context of media and TV? Streaming on demand is great. How could it work? Could it be just like Rebecca shows up and she goes, I want to watch this. It's on right now. And, you know, I sign up with a credit card and, you know, it's a dollar for every 10 minutes that I watch. Is that the sort of way it might work? So I, you know, obviously we'd have to fold into like the current model is that you have to subscribe to the provider. Like, you know, Netflix, it's, I don't know what it is now. It's closer to like $12 a month. Yeah. Um, you know, ESPN has just launched in an effort to be competitive, a similar service in which you can just subscribe to their on-demand service for live sport. Um, in the same way, I'm not sure Hulu just launched their Hulu has live sports with the women's world cup, uh, which I was so, you know, I think that campaign is brilliant by the way. Um, and so, you know, I'm not sure if there is, it's interesting. I would be curious to see some sort of like, you know, some research put into, would you pay X amount just to watch this event, um, you know, on a, on a platform? Um, most of it is subscription based as I understand it with the, because it's the big names, right? It doesn't, it doesn't really benefit ESPN just to say, we'll, we'll charge you 10 bucks just to watch this event. They want you to, to subscribe five, you know, $5 a month for, for a year. Um, so I'm not sure if that is really available widely anywhere. Um, I would be curious to see if there's been some, I'm sure there's been some, plenty of research put into that um, to see the kind of return. Um, re, you know, rowing such a niche sport and we're also really passionate about it that I would be, I would think that you could probably capture, you know, that, that aspect in a way that people be like, yeah, I'll pay $5 to watch this on, the, you know, on the spot. And you've made a really, really good point there. So as a marketer, knowing who your audience is, is the first step towards selling anything. And mm -hmm. I and you pretty much know where we can find probably between 60 and 80% of the rowing audience who are already digitally savvy, who are already following rowing things online. And it would be pretty blooming easy to promote something to them. I, as a marketer, would have absolutely no qualms about that. And of course, the broadcast, the existing broadcast contracts, you know, would have to be tapered out. And I could see that there will be legal challenges that would have to be overcome. But I can't help but think that making something more freely available for more people who, if you gave them a means of paying, they would probably choose to pay rather than choose to find some pirated service. Do you feel that that's a valid point? Yeah, I think that's a good point. It's interesting because I was as you were as you were asking a question, I was just thinking more about I mean, because we now have embargoes of because of our deal with the Olympic Channel and NBC. And I was just the same thing I'd forgotten. And I woke up this past weekend to watch Europeans. And I was like, this is not available in your country. And I was like, oh, and I, I don't have a subscription to a local cable provider that is a partner with NBC and the Olympic Channel. So I can't I can't go on and watch it. But it's not, I can't, in my mind, it's, you know, it's not the, the FIFA World Cup final. It's rowing. And so we know where we stand. And so there, the rights and the licensing, it can't be so much so that there is a loss by providing that free. And that's where I get a little bit held up. I mean, I would love if that were the case, but it's just not. And so, you know, how, how are we using, our, you know, is that benefiting the sport? Is that benefiting kind of, you know, a return um, on, on that kind of deal? There's been a lot of conversation around that deal. I mean, I love the Olympic channel. I think it's great, but I don't like withholding, um, you know, viewing sports, especially niche sports. So I do think that if there were an opportunity to, you know, you could sub license, right? So say there's a sub license platform that would say, fine, you know, Olympic Channel, like we'll we'll pay you for the rights to 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 simulcast to stream, and it's a pay per view, um, and so you know, pay per view is, is kind of like ten years, twenty years old, but I think there's still plenty of pay per view out there with big fights, and usually it's it's big fights, right? It's like boxing matches, but you wonder, and that's a niche sport, that's a niche following, right? You wonder with with a sport like rowing if there was a pay per view model, how successful it would be. Um, and how, 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 I don't, it would have, it would have to be like a sub licensor of the big events. Right. And I'm yeah. not really sure how that would work. Um, but I can't imagine, I can't, I just can't imagine the fee would be insurmountable, but maybe not. It, the, the thing is, as you rightly say, 
if you have a a goal in mind, getting the experts on board to get the legal contracts written, rewritten, adjusted, get the pricing experts on board. These things can be overcome where there's a will. So let's move on to talk about world rowing because FISA have fabulously reinvented themselves. So before you joined the sport, they had a print newspaper, which they would send out about three or four times a year. And they rebranded as World Rowing, which I thought was really good because um, initials really aren't easy to find online. Uh, and they built themselves, I believe, a very strong online media brand. As an athlete, what do you think about what they've done? Yeah, and I, yes, like I, I even noticed, I feel like I came in when that, that change was happening. Um, and I, you know, I love the short form content that they create out of the events in terms of, you know, the kind of the short videos, the access to the athletes, uh, you know, the topics they cover. Um, I think that, you know, that that is absolutely that's that has to help with the sport. I'd love to see sort of right. Have they done a survey of kind of engagement and increased exposure? Can they sell that? I'm just it still it still rocks me that they haven't been able to find um, some like presenting sponsors for the events. Um, and maybe the, the price isn't right. But at this point, I feel like there's there's got to be enough. Um, and all of the work that they're doing in that rebrand and even written form content with the online, they revamped their website a handful of years ago, um, which looks a lot better, too. Um, but I do. I think that they've I think they've really upped their game. And I think that that's that's like step one. Right. Um, and I, I do think that it also provides a model um, for whether it's other, you know, federations and national governing bodies to say, hey, you know, this is this is our sport. This is what the international federation is doing. Like this is how we can this is how we can start to improve our coverage as well. I do see I think U.S. rowing has started to attempt that. We've, you know, in the past couple of years on very small levels, but, you know, trying to create, you know, with our limited resources, ways in which we're, right, short form content, providing access to athletes, telling, you know, the stories, going out and putting together a cool, you know, one minute video of a training session, because um, people love that. And it, you know, you see the views that it gets. And that's, that's really what people want to see. It is absolutely what people want to see. And when I say people, I mean, anyone from like age 12 up who's allowed absolutely. to have an Instagram account, they love that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you see, I mean, the world growing, yeah, they get, they get good, good views and good numbers and that's got to convert, you know, when you're, when you're talking to marketing dollars and TV, I mean, it converts. That's, that's where you start talking about, you know, impressions and how you can sell that and the kind of content that actually leads to meaningful, you know, dollars. Um, so. So that's where I think the disconnect lies. I think that World Rowing has done a fabulous job of building an audience, building an audience across several different media platforms and, is creating engaging content over and over. So I think they've got that absolutely nailed. Where I believe they have quite possibly got an opportunity which they're not even exploiting is their sponsors. If you go to any page on their website in the footer, there is a scrolling bar of well-known rowing brands who are supposedly gold, silver and bronze level sponsors. Now, I have never seen the contract that they sign. I don't know what money they pay, but I absolutely know that it was originally based on giving them access to the boat park at the mm -hmm. World Rowing Championships so that they can have a trade stand inside there where, of course, the coaches and the athletes walk by. There is no crossover, as far as I can see, to any of their online media for any of their sponsors, not even a watermark, not even a promotional video, not even mention of or an article about those businesses. And if I was the marketing manager in any one of those businesses, I would be pushing so hard to get my brand more prominently using content marketing, not advertising, using content to get my brand in front of the audience that they built. And for me, that's just like, it's like two trains on parallel tracks that should be absolutely on a collision course because the explosion of value to the sponsors will be giant. Have you seen that? 
Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And now you're you're talking like this is my area where I came from ESPN in terms of programming, which was I did scheduling and acquisitions, but we worked very closely with you know the sponsors and getting how how can we package this event and how can we package the series events to be interesting to whether it's our current sponsors, so it's a value add, so they keep coming back for more, or it's saying, hey, this is what you're paying for us now. If we did this for you. What you know? What does that look like in terms of you know? What can you come in you know with with this kind of presentation of, of your brand, your logo, et cetera? Um, and I do you know? It's interesting you say that. I, I've wondered the same thing. Of I know that I know World Rowing has to have some sort of level of sponsors, um, but I haven't. I I couldn't list. I couldn't list you any of them because I don't see them anywhere except for that scrolling bar. So you you know you have to believe that you know they've they've cultivated and they've they've kind of created this arsenal of content and you know i think we're doing they're doing a great job with that but there's there's also there's so many more opportunities for what they could be doing given the fact that if the sponsors um, and the companies that already have relationships have a say and they say hey we really want to we want to present you know the top women athletes of 2019 I can find you sponsors that would love to be a part of that campaign, especially right now. You know, the, the climate and the culture and it's all about the women athletes and, um, you know, what we're seeing with the, the FIFA World Cup, uh, for the Women's World Cup. I mean, you come up, you basically come up with campaigns, right? And I think that World Rowing has that. They have, they have the, the content, they have the ability, they have the, you know, they don't have to, they don't have to create anything else. They just need to package it in a way that makes sense, not only for, you know, for the advertisers, for the sponsors, but also for viewers, right? Like I would love to, I, I could follow Sunita Pascura, like, yeah, she's a badass. Exactly. <laughs> so that's where I think the disconnect is. I do not think they have people in on their team who have the commercial acumen to understand the sponsorship landscape alongside the media landscape. And the other thing that I think is also, and I'm sorry, I know is another failing, is that rowing brands, and let's be really clear, we're talking boat makers, we're talking oar makers, we're talking clothing manufacturers, the traditional businesses that we all buy from are vastly underskilled in marketing. There is, I've been running this, you know, two commercial rowing businesses, rowing media businesses, and persuading people that advertising to an audience that I have here cupped in my hand waiting for great content is worthwhile has been a real uphill struggle. And I have taken the approach that rather than asking for big dollar because they will just say no, is to go in and ask for almost micro payments. And I did this. So one of the last things I did for Row Perfect before I left the company was to have a page called Christmas gifts for rowers. So this is a traditional thing that happens once or twice a year and bloggers have covered it and every organization pretty much, perhaps except the boat builders, you know, has products that are suitable as a gift. And so I built a page that individual businesses could buy a postage stamp sized illustration, a link, a little bit of text that would go from the Row Perfect page straight out to their online store where people could buy. And the price was very, very modest. And I did pretty well. And yet it was interesting who took up that offer. Hmm. World Rowing took it up because they wanted to promote uh, fundraising for the Kafui uh, River and Rowing Canoeing Base in Africa, which is their charity. It was also taken up by brands such as there's a, a blue jeans manufacturer that makes men's jeans cut to fit people who have large thighs. So if you're an athlete, you will know that your legs don't fit in yeah. or your legs fit in the waist too big. So, you know, wonderful niche businesses, but they're all non-traditional businesses. They are products that have been built up, designed for a modern online only audience. They don't have retail outlets. They are direct to consumer brands. Whereas I feel that the vast majority of rowing businesses will take an advert in a newspaper, in a magazine on Row2K and nothing wrong with that, but they don't follow through with micro campaigns and audience engagement. And as a consequence, they don't understand that as part of the marketing mix. And so they don't value the fact that there's an audience who will be listening to you and me right now as we talk, 
who could be out there buying your blue jeans. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I agree. And I, I, when I think about the tradition of our sport, it definitely spans to, you know, the traditionally like the boat makers, I would say. Um, I think we've seen a reprisal and kind of concept too with having to market to like CrossFit, right? It brought them into a, a different, kind of a different world outside of rowing. So now, you know, you do see, I've seen their marketing like really change because they're like, oh, there's this whole other population that we can go to. Um, I don't think it's because the rowing community is so small, um, but I wonder if it's because I've often wondered, is, the, is there no, I, I have to believe there's competition but is it that the boat makers and the, you know, kind of the companies that are traditional have been in the sport of rowing for so long, just, you know, they don't believe that there's enough competition for them to have to put in the effort for marketing. I think that they believe that the way people buy boats is still traditional. Mm -hmm. that all they have to do is influence the coaches and they will get the orders. Whereas I slightly suspect club, the way clubs buying boats is random you know someone will make a donation or they will um you know get a um, a grant or a gift or they will fundraise and the decision making process is totally opaque because it tends to go through a club committee and the committees change so i think although coaches are often an influencer in that i don't think they make all the decisions and i have been in situations where I think people have made some poor purchase decisions with regards to buying boats for high school crews for, you know, for club crews. Right. And if you believe that coaches are your influencer, and if you believe that being in the boat park where you can see and meet the coaches and they know them all, you know, I absolutely don't fault their sales strategy on that front. But again, it's very much a traditional one-to-one -one relationship, whereas the media you and I are talking about is one-to-many, and it's dialogue, not monologue. So it's moved beyond the, we need to have an advert on the back cover of the rowing magazine four times a year, and maybe a little profile piece or some nice, or in fact, I think a couple of them do a really nice calendar of world rowing athletes in their boats. Well, you know, why wouldn't they? But how do you get a hold of that calendar? Well, you only get the calendar if you meet them in the boat park and you only get the calendar if you buy a boat from them. And you're like, well, there's a probably 99.8% of the rowing population will never see that calendar, will never go and approach you in a boat park because you're not at the regattas that they're at. Therefore, how are you influencing purchase decisions for the future raft of coaches who right now are coming out of university and know that they're going to stop rowing, but they'd like to coach. So for me as a marketer, I see a huge raft of opportunities that they aren't even beginning to address. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think you summed it up well there. Yeah, absolutely. And yet let's go back to Concept2 and Nelson Kellerman, who are probably the two biggest brands that we both know. And I know people at both of those organizations, and you're right, they do do some really good marketing. However, when you describe Concept2 going into, you know, they've got the ski erg, they've got um, a kayak erg, they've got this CrossFit market for their traditional rowing machines, they have chosen not to use the same marketing techniques back into rowing. And that, again, I think smacks of complacency because, again, there are challenges coming up. We all possibly do listeners know about Peloton. Peloton mm -hmm. is an online cycling app where you can do training sessions and races with other users live through the internet. Now, Matt Lira, Matt, yeah, Matt Lira and Bruce Smith, ex of CRI in Boston, have started a rowing company that has got a rowing machine that pretty much aims to do the same thing. It has a Tesla sized monitor through which you can stream videos of coaches talking you through workouts and you can then join any other athletes in rowing along with them. It's been aimed at the non-water rowing market for now, but we know it's going to be coming, you know, what's Concept2 do, do doing, you know, to counteract that? What are they doing to counteract the RP3 dynamic rowing machine and other dynamic rowing machines? And I don't think they see marketing and marketing communications as a battleground yet. And yet, if you look at Felipe boats, when you were starting rowing, Felipe's were very rarely in finals at the World Rowing Championships. And nowadays, 
there are, particularly on the women's side, fewer and fewer yellow boats and more and more white boats. And so you can see that change has been happening. It's just that I think the method of making the communication work is bifurcating. I think there are online and offline channels and there's nothing wrong with both of them. But I su suggest that most brands could do with looking more closely at where their future audience is. Yeah, I agree. Well, and it's, as you were talking, you know, it's, rowers are generally rowers for life. So the lifetime of that sale and potential sale and recurring sale is, you know, once you get a customer, you probably will have them for a very long time, right? If you, if you treat them, if you do it right. Um, and so it's interesting, you know, with that in mind that there isn't more effort to kind of maintain a customer and really, you know, engage the rowing, kind of that rowing customer. Um, it does feel, complacency is maybe a good word for it in the sense that it just doesn't feel, we don't have to put in the effort because they're gonna come to us, but because there is, you know, there's slowly, perhaps it's the boiling frog analogy, there is actually slowly, you know, there's slowly coming this competition that until you don't see any more yellow boats in the final, Impacker's like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> Maybe we have an issue. We got to start. We got to start an Instagram page, which they did. You know, I wrote in Parker, so I can say this. Um, you know, yeah. which they did this year. And so it, it is that it's that sense of you know. I think that maybe for as hardworking as we are, and maybe because it's it's the rower. You know, it takes a long time to make changes, and we got you know it takes a long time to get fit. Um, it's just the mentality of you know, it takes a long time, but I think that there could be so much return um, by little things, right, that these companies can do. Um, and like I said, I mean, to start that with, you know, rowers are generally rowers for life. And so I don't know any other industry where a product can apply to a person for, for a lifetime. Um, and I don't think companies are quite taking advantage of that. Very, very true. And I think those little marketing communication experiments is a really good way to start. And I know that there are some very bright marketers who are working in these rowing companies and I'm putting proposals to them regularly and they get slapped down by their superiors who won't let them speculate, you know, a little bit of their marketing budget on doing something that's a little different. And that's normal. It happens across a lot of industries, not just rowing. But I do believe that those are the men and women who are out there, who are engaging in Instagram, who are getting passionate about the sport, but they also have the marketing communication media skills, people like you, mm -hmm. who can then begin to, as they acquire authority, make decisions and try things. You know, I don't know if the rowing gifts for Christmas page, you know, could become super popular, but I absolutely know that I copied it from the Guardian newspaper who do it every <laughs> single year who charge a competent fee, and then they have no more than 230, I think, different products that are allowed. And once those slots are filled, that's the end. Are there 230 different gifts you could give a rower for Christmas? Hell yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, that's a good point. I lost, I had a thought as you were talking. Um, it'll come back to me. But yeah, it'll come back to me. <laughs> Oh, what was I thinking? I hope you can cut this off. <laughs> anyway. Let's talk about other people who are really helping to grow the public interest in rowing. I recently came across a YouTuber called Cameron Buchan. He's a Scottish guy who's been trying to get into the British team. I think he was in it before he got dropped. He does daily YouTube lives from the cafe inside Leander Club in London. He's very engaging. It's, if I'm being honest, reasonably low fidelity broadcast, but he splices together video of him and his friends eating pasta. Uh, he has a little GoPro or equivalent that sits on the rigger of his boat. And he says, oh, we're going to go out and do 20K and I'm in the two seat of a four and this is what we're doing. And he speeds it up and slows it down. So there's a little bit of editing in there. But the commentary and the engagement below every one of his videos is intense. And he has maybe around a thousand followers, so not big. But as a rowing brand, I'm interested in him. 
I'm interested in his journey, his unique voice that he is bringing to, you know, the struggle, you know, which you, of course, understand because your situation actually is identical, is it not? <laughs> Who else have you seen who's out there really bringing the public closer to rowing? So as as I, I want to re respond to this, because it, it struck me that sometimes I wonder if, you know, the purity and trueness of our sport is such a, it's we, we really focus on the team, right? And so I think, and I even think U.S. rowing, when I we, we struggle with this, the identity of being able to focus on individuals because it's so much about the boat. Um, but when you look at other sports, when you think swimming, who's the first name that comes to mind? Michael Phelps. So you don't think the U.S. men's swimming team, right? You think Michael Phelps. When you think gymnastics, it's probably like Simone Biles when I'm, I'm just thinking Team USA. But when, you know, for us, when you think United States rowing, like there's not, there's a, there's a handful of names because I'm a current athlete, but I guarantee you that the lay person can't recall one name because we've, we haven't, and I'll just speak to our, my own situation, but I don't see, you know, other sports or other countries, you know, that have smaller teams, obviously, like, I think that they're, you know, when you think of, I bet most, actually, if you ask the lay person rowing, they'd be like the O'Donovan brothers, you know, from their Olympic, right. you know, kind of their Olympic, like podium pants. But that's, I mean, I loved that, right? Um, and so, you know, I do think that that'll also be something we need to as a sport, um, as you know, at the US, you know, our own NGB, but even, even world rowing to really start to highlight the individual. And maybe that's, it's counter to kind of what makes us rowers. Um, but I think we can celebrate the individual by also celebrating the team. And that's what's interesting. You talking about Cameron is his name. You know, he's, he's sharing his individual story and people can gravitate towards that. Um, and I do think that we, we do need more of that. Um, you know, when I think of kind of at the elite level, you know, they're in my, in terms of my peers, I think the Sinkovich brothers do some interesting stuff on Instagram. You know, it's kind of, they've got the brother thing and like, you can kind of relate and you're like, man, I can get behind this. It's, you know, they've been in the quad and then they were the double and now they're the pair. Um, you know, even, you know, people like Hamish Bond and Eric Murray, um, Hamish is a little bit more quieter, but you know, Eric puts, puts quite a bit out there. Yeah. Right. Rowing with you know, goats. Did you see that? Yeah. Did an I, with these goats wandering around his garage. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, in my, my blog video, I mentioned the popularity of pygmy goats. So I was like, this is perfect, Eric. Um, you know, so there are the individuals out there doing really interesting things. You know, Eric's not even competing at the elite level anymore, but he certainly has a huge following um, and is, you know, and is a star. And so just him showing, yeah, like out on his erg with some goats is it's <laughs> like, it's silly, but it's actually entertaining. Right. And so I do think, um, you know, there are, I think that the individuals need to continue. It's going to be upon us. Like, I think as rowers, it's funny. Some of the comments I got about that piece was that, you know, well, we're, we're, we're all rowers. We're introverts. I was like, not all rowers are introverts. <laughs> and I was like, let's not categorize ourselves that way. But also just because we love the sport doesn't mean we can't celebrate the sport. Um, and I, you know, I think that some people feel uh, that, it's, you know, it's such a team sport that we can't be celebrating the individual. So I would love, love, love for more people to be sharing kind of their, their story. Um, you know, I, I'm trying to think of other big names. I'll have to go check out this Cameron guy. I love the, the con like the, the time that he's putting into that to share his, you know, his journey. I've seen, you know, I've seen a handful of interesting, there's some clubs in the U S that kind of do some really interesting things. Seattle scholars in Seattle, Washington, the coach there is really good with his drone. And he puts together some really fascinating stuff. And it's awesome. He puts it to music. He cuts it. Um, it's great. It's really entertaining stuff. But also there's not a broad platform where more people can access him. Like you can kind of go down the rabbit hole of Instagram. But what if we had, you know, I don't even know, like a different rowing platform where there was an actual. Yeah. So I, I tried this back in the day. When Facebook first started, you, you still can. You can embed a tiny bit of code on a web page that shows a Facebook feed. So for when I was running the Row Perfect website, I made a page that had embedded on it the US rowing Facebook feed, Canada rowing Avaron, that I had the British rowing and, and then popular athletes as well, so that you could go to this one page and see the most recent three updates from a very diverse range of rowing brands, let's say. 
and it didn't fly. People were much happier doing their Facebook thing. In those days, it was all on a browser because most of us didn't have, you know, smartphones. But I still feel that there is an opportunity to aggregate um, interesting rowing stuff. And you see this if you're subscribed to the Row 2K weekly newsletter. They mm -hmm. have the best of rowing in Instagram, which is them sharing other people's stuff which is kind of cool because if your stuff gets mentioned there, that's really nice. But it's not anything that I think they're monetizing, but it's also just showing us the tip of the iceberg of how could you make a, a rowing platform where I could individualize the stuff that I'm interested in. Say I'm not into the rowing drone stuff. I don't want him. So it's not someone else's curated content. It's just my opportunity to pull anything I want in there and it be, you know, what I'd read at lunchtime. Well, and then you create a positive feedback loop, right? And so that's that's the this concept around Instagram and and you know, people people want shares, they want likes. And so if there was a place where people would be sort of rewarded for creating interesting content in specific to rowing, and that, oh man, I can, you know, I can have my Instagram video up on X platform or, you know, I'm gonna take a really great Instagram photo because Row 2K is gonna share it. You know, that's that's that drives people to do that now, is that it 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 becomes the impetus for content creation when there is incentive um, yeah. out there. So, absolutely. Now I'm going to give you a magic wand, mm -hmm. and you can wave it and make a wish. So let's thinking about rowing and media. What's your wish? <sighs> that we are able to we. <laughs> So I'm just gonna to speak to the elite professional kind of level, um, that we are able to create a series of events that you know, allows for the invitation of you know, people outside the rowing world to enjoy our sport um, and to consume it separate from the Olympics. And so that when the Olympics come around, people already have a basic understanding of what our sport is. They know the names of the athletes competing. They understand which countries are dominant in certain events and others. You know, and I think that um, you know, the platforms out there are the ones that exist are beginning to open their doors to, I don't wanna say lower produced, but cheaper content. You know, we can find ourselves when I say we rowing, we can find ourselves on on the ESPNs, on the Olympic Channel. Obviously, we're there, but you know, more and more content can actually be put on those platforms because the price of production has lowered so so much just in the last five ten years. And so, I would love you know year round content consumption, not just the four events over the summer, um, so that you know people who want to consume rowing at a very high and interesting level have a place to go. They know where to find it, and you know by kind of by design, then, you know, if it's, if it's there, other people will find it too. I would love to get the attention of big name sponsors like Red Bull, obviously has sponsored some, you know, rowing events already, but can, you know, can we expand that? And I think we can, uh, because just by association, when Red Bull is a part of, you know, they're covering rowing, then you're going to bring in other audiences. And so we need to not only, you know, market and engage the current rowing community and, and audience, we need to figure out a way to, to create that, you know, that cross, kind of cross integration, crossover into other, you know, kind of other audiences that could that could find our sport interesting because because there are crashes around a state turn, because there are, you know, flips in a canal or whatever it is, whatever it takes. Um, but I think that's, you know, I'm hoping that we we as a sport can can embrace the need to be innovative and to change our sport to the level at which it doesn't obviously, you know, it's not gonna degrade the value and tradition of our sport, but I think we can be creative of enough to to bring in other audiences. Um, I think the the time is right for it. There's there's a ton of opportunity out there, and I just we're not we're not making the connection quite yet. So my my magic wand would be that you know we're never going to be the 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 Sunday night like Monday night featured event on ESPN, but we can certainly find ourselves you know um, on those platforms and even on live television um, you know on a yearly basis. Uh, and that athletes' names are, you know, they're commonly known, that people know when they think rowing, they think, you know, Mahi Drysdale, they think Emma Twig, they think Sunita Pispura, like they know the names um, because we're, we're such a, we're at least, you know, the stars of our sport are common. I wholeheartedly endorse your vision. Now, just to wrap up, 
Rowing Tales. I do <laughs> this anthology once a year, and I would love to hear a rowing tale from you. Sure. So started this conversation by telling you my, you know, my entry into the sport is sort of a, you know, it's a, a very unique one. Um, when I first was invited and, and came to Princeton, New Jersey to join with the National Team Training Center for about the first three months, I, we would, you know, before every practice, you know, this is common for every rower and for any athlete, you know, the coach talks to the team, talks to the members and said, this is, you know, this is what we're going to do today. These are the drills. We have, you know, there's like a whiteboard and kind of have the drills written, um, written there. It looked like a foreign language to me for months. I had no idea what, you know, top quarter, half slide, like all of, you know, we kind of fully written out. And then just to hear it, you know, Tom Terhar, the coach would, would say it. And I just, I remember just like, just doing this and being like, I have no idea. Um, and I'm usually pretty intuitive. I can pick up on things, but for months. And so <laughs> when we would get out on the water and I'm usually in a single, I made the mistake of doing this in a double, but out on the single, I would just have to look around and see what all the other athletes were doing and saying like, okay, I'm gonna guess that, that that looks like, okay, that's half slide or, you know, that's quarter feather, that's, you know, and I would just have to mimic for the longest time what the other athletes around me were doing and just kind of fake it till I make it. I remember when I was in like a double and did, you know, the, the athlete called the drill and I just like did whatever I thought it would be. She stopped and kind of said, so were you doing you know, I think it was like quarter, half, you know, some sort of rendition of a drill. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So for a long time, I was I was a fraud and just had to just pick it up and figure it out. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's applicable lessons to life, right? Like, don't, you know, don't be afraid to be a fool for a while. Like, you'll, you'll eventually figure it out. So... <laughs> Well, thank you. That is a great insight. And it does, it is one of the things that frustrates me somewhat that the um, the sh rowing shorthand, particularly when written, is rubbish to anyone who hasn't got a clue what a two times slash two minus is. Oh, felt like, yes, it was like Dr. Scratch in a, like I was just, I have no idea. I'm not even gonna try. <laughs> Megan, it's been an absolute delight talking to you. Thank you so much for your insight, for starting this discussion. I encourage people to go back to Megan O'Leary's blog and find the article, which is called Why Elite Rowing Will Never Be Popular in the United States. Please tell people where they can connect with you online. Yeah, so my Twitter and Instagram handle is at Megan O'Leary1 and MeganO'Leary.net is my website and Megan O'Leary Athlete is my Facebook page. And to all the listeners, please join the discussion. Write comments under this blog, share it with your friends, and let's see what we can do together to start to change the rowing media landscape because it's a really exciting time to be in this wonderful sport of ours. That was Rowing Chat for this month. Till next time. Goodbye.